Hello there, welcome to my channel on chemistry lessons. This is a BTEC Applied Science Unit 5 Chemistry and we're going to be looking over the January 2020 paper. So there it is. I think, um, if my memory serves me correct, this was literally as COVID broke. Um, so you won't find a June 2020 paper because it didn't exist. Um, but yeah, this was the last paper I sat before COVID. And you'll get 50 minutes for this, which I think is quite generous. Um, here we go. First of all, if you don't subscribe, please do. Your support is very much appreciated. And please take advantage of the likes and comments features to let me know what we think. So question one then, or the first three marks of question one anyway. As always, I'm going to suggest you pause the video and you have a go at the questions. And when you're ready to hear the answers, you can unpause the video. So 1A, calcium hydroxide is a typical metal or typical metal hydroxide, sorry, identify a chemical property of calcium hydroxide. Right, well, what we learned about at the very beginning was that metal oxides and metal hydroxides were bases. They would react with metals. We actually saw that once you got to aluminium oxide, alumina, that was actually amphoteric and would react with acids and bases. But the answer here for calcium hydroxide is it's a base. One use of calcium hydroxide then? Well, it's used in industry to treat acidic effluent. So it's used to neutralize acidic effluent or acidic waste in industry. It's also used to increase the pH of soil um, in agriculture. So either of those would be absolutely fine. OK, a technician wants to determine the heat transferred when calcium hydroxide dissolves in water. The initial temperature was 289 Kelvin. Give the temperature in degrees. Now, you may remember that what we need to do is minus 273, in which case you're going to get an answer here of 16 degrees. They do tell you in the question, though, that it's 273.2. So strictly speaking, we should be taking away 273.2. So the actual answer is 15.8. However, if you did write 16, they will give you the mark. So that would still be classed as correct. Next three marks then. This is about heat transfer in a chemical process. We can see there's a calculation. What I'll do is I'll put a link to the video here for this particular topic. If you want to watch the video first, you can follow that link. Otherwise, pause the video, have a go at the question. And when you're ready for me to go through it, you can unpause the video. OK, it is seeming quite typical here that they, they give you the equation. I've seen a few of these questions now. They always seem to give you the equation, but it's not a particularly difficult one. It's the mass of the water multiplied by the specific heat capacity. You'll always be given the specific heat capacity. You don't need to remember that one. We're given the mass of the water times by change in temperature. So it's the difference in temperature here. The temperature's gone from 289 up to 292.9 so the change in temperature is 3.9 so that's my delta t change in temperature i know that this value that i get is going to be in joules okay and just be careful do they want the answer in joules or kilojoules because i've seen both this time they've asked for it in joules so i don't need to do anything to the answer once i get it just get in my calculator 750 multiplied by 4.18 multiplied by 3.9 equals and that equals 12226.5 and that will be measured in joules so that's the correct answer i don't need to convert it into kilojoules that's my final answer so final part to question one then uh, it's worth four marks which is quite a lot and before we start, I'll put a link up here for you to follow to check out the theory on this video. Um, but when you're ready to answer the question, I suggest you, you pause it, you have a go. And when you want to hear the answer, you can unpause the video. Right. OK, so enthalpy change is negative for positive ions and for negative ions. Explain why it's negative for any ion or why it's always negative. So we're going to say that hydration is exothermic or we can just say that it's an exothermic change so we're pointing out that we're aware that negative means exothermic 
that's going to give me the first mark. What I'm then going to say is I'm going to point out that the positive ion is attracted to the delta minus on the oxygen. And the negative ion is going to be attracted to the hydrogen delta plus. So pointing out the fact that water is polar, it's got delta plus, which will attract negative ions, and delta minus, which will attract positive ions, which is why it's exothermic for both positive and negative. And this is what the mark scheme looks like. So you can have a little look at the mark scheme there. Make rub those out so you can check the mark scheme. So you can see there, there's where my four points are going to come from. Moving on to question two then. So as always, pause the video, have a go, and when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause the video. Right, so first off, we've got to balance an equation. Right, it's 2C6, so that's going to be 12 carbons, so I need to put 12 here. Hydrogens, I've got two lots of 14, so that's 28. So I need to put 14 here to have the 28. You can check the oxygen balance, but, but, but that's your final answer. It's going to be one mark for the 12 and one mark for the 14. Part two, identify the correct statement about the standard enthalpy change of combustion. An excess of oxygen gas is used. I agree with that actually, so I think that's correct, but I'm going to make sure the rest are wrong. It says carbon monoxide and water form. No, complete combustion has to occur, so it has to be carbon dioxide. So I'm saying it's not this one. Conditions are 273 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. Well, no, it's 298 Kelvin is standard conditions. 100 kilopascals is correct, but this one's wrong. Two moles of hexane are burnt. No, it's not. By definition, it's when one mole of a substance is reacted with oxygen or burnt in oxygen. So the answer is A, excess oxygen is used. And B, hexane and two isomers of hexane are shown. So we've got hexane here, and then we've got the two isomers. It wants me to name isomer W, right? So the longest chain is one, two, three, four, five. So it's pentane. But there's a methyl here. There's a methyl group, and it's on the one, two, three, one, two, three. So it doesn't matter which direction I count from. So it's three methyl pentane. Moving on to the final part of this question then, explain why hexane and 2,2-dimethylbutane are isomers. That's because they have the same molecular formula. But different structural formula. Identify and justify which isomer has the lowest boiling point, right? Well, what we learned here was that if they have the same molecular formula, then the one with the lowest boiling point will be the one with the most branched. So it's the most branched isomer, which in this case was the 2,2-dimethyl butane that had the most branches. Justification, it's the most branched which meant the smallest surface area and weakest van der Waals forces of attraction. My writing is really scruffy today. I think I'm trying to do it too quick, but there we go. So it was the most branched. Moving on to question three. So this is about polymerization of ethene. And again, I'll attempt to put a link to the correct video um, on the top here. But when you're ready to answer this, have a pause the video, have a go. And when you're ready, unpause. Right, there's an awful lot of writing going on here, but this is showing the, the main stages of the mechanism of polymerization. And if you've seen the video, the final step what happens is one of these R radicals attaches with this. So for my first mark, I have an R radical here, 
And all I need to do is copy this out. CH2, 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 one, two, three, there's four of them. CH2, R. There we go, that's my second mark. Part B, titanium 4 chloride, TiCl4, can be used as a catalyst in the polymerization of ethene. TiCl4 is made during the extraction of titanium from titanium 4 oxide. Give the formula of titanium 4 oxide. Well, titanium 4 means it's 4 plus. Oxide is 2 minus. So that must mean we need two oxides to one titanium, TiO2. Okay, so the next five marks then, pause the video, and when you want to hear the answer, you can unpause. Right, okay, so what we're looking at here, we've got titanium, a transition metal, and transition metals form complexes. That's what happens when we see a transition metal surrounded by other species. So this is known as a transition metal complex. And I will confess that if you're watching this video um, in January 23, 2023, then I am going to have to put out another video because I am aware that there's more on transition metals in these past exams than my videos currently cover, I think. So I'm going to be making one extra video on transition metal complexes, but unfortunately won't be out for the January 23 exam. So that's a transition metal complex. State what the wedges mean, right? Okay, I do. we do know what these mean. We've talked about these when we've done shapes of molecules, particularly when we talked about the shape of alkenes and alkanes. So this shows the bonds at the front of the molecule or coming out of the page. So it's a 3D showing the bonds at the front or the atoms at the front or the bonds that are coming out of the page. Okay, so here we've been asked to explain how the catalyst works or how it lowers the amount of energy because we know that the term catalyst will lower the activation energy they do so by offering an alternative reaction pathway so that'll actually be my first mark i can say it offers an alternative reaction pathway that's a mark now there's two ways this can happen okay so you could go down the route of saying that it will accept electrons from the ethene and then transfer them back to the R group at the end. That works. Or you can say that the TiCl4 weakens the bond in the ethene, which then allows the bond to break and react with the R group. And this is what the mark scheme looks like, you see. So you've got a couple of directions you can go down. So I, I said at the beginning there that offers an alternative reaction pathway will be your first mark. And then we've got to go from um, two of the other marks here. So weakens the bond or accept electrons. Or you, can, you can actually mention all of them to get make sure you've covered both bases. OK, but that's a tough question because that's more of an application type question based on what we know about catalysts. So I suppose the summary here is if you're asked about catalyst, if you're unsure, you can just regurgitate what you know about offering alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy. It weakens the bonds in the reactants and allows them to react. Here we, you can see that there's no collision required. You could, you could say that, that because they bind to the catalyst, they don't have to collide with each other. Or you can go down the idea of that they accept and donate electrons back. So they're good at having variable oxidation states and transferring electrons. So all, if in doubt and you're asked about transition metal catalysts, you can always give that answer. Moving to question four, pause the video, see if you can answer these four marks and then unpause the video. So this is talking about the bonding in propene. And then again, I'll try and put a link above there for you to follow to, to watch the video first if you want to. And when you're ready to hear the answer, you can unpause the video and I'll go through it. Right, the bonding between C1 and C2. This is a single bond and it's known as a sigma bond. I could say the electrons are shared directly between the two nuclei. I could, I could say that. I don't have to for full marks here, but I could. Between C2 and C3, it's a double bond. 
which is in fact a sigma bond and a pi bond. I could go on to say that the sigma bond is the same as in C1 and C2, which is when the electrons are shared directly between the, the nuclei. The pi bond is the overlap of p orbitals and is above and below the nuclei. But I don't have to. What I've written there is actually worth four marks. Next two marks for part B. Again, pause the video. Um, and when you're ready to hear the answer to this, unpause the video. Okay, so we've been given some structural formula for propene. It's talking about bond angles and Y is a greater bond angle than X. Right, well, we know that carbon one is going to be tetrahedral with a bond angle of 109.5 degrees because there's four bonds. So that's X, should have made that clear, that's X. For Y, it's going to be trigonal planar, and that was 120 degrees, and that's because there was only three bonds instead of four. So there's only three bonds to repel each other so they can get further away. When there's four bonds to repel each other, they can't quite get as far away. Final one mark to this question then, pause the video, and then I'll go through the answer when you're ready. Propene, the reaction of propene with bromine forms a single product Z. Okay, so this is adding an, adding a halogen. So what happens here is the halogen is added across the double bond. We end up with a BR here and a BR here. So it's not that one, it's not that one, it's not, it's C. The answer is C. Suppose make sure when you do your multiple choice that you very carefully put a cross in that box. So on to the last question then. And as always, it's a six marker. Don't dread the six marker, look forward to it because usually they are an easy place to pick up all six marks. It's not about writing loads and loads. It's about making sure you answer the question in front of you. So always break the question with a two or three bits. Usually it's two and make sure you fully answer both bits and you will pick up all six marks. I'm just gonna suggest you pause the video and you have a go. And when you're ready to hear my answer and see the mark scheme, unpause the video. So here we're asked to do two things, similarities and differences of the two um, industrial processes using electrolysis. So there's quite a long list for both, to be honest, and you just need to get some of each. So three of each would be enough here. So in terms of similarities, um, I'm going to say that they both use electricity to separate substances. In both cases, the raw materials are ionic compounds, such as aluminium oxide and sodium chloride. I'm going to say that both electrolytes contain ions that can move. I can also say that elements are formed at both electrodes, and that's going to be more than enough for my similarities. There are more, and you'll see them when I put the mark scheme up. In terms of differences, the aluminium one is dissolved in creolite, and the Sodium chloride is not. Aluminium is also done molten. The sodium chloride is aqueous, which is dissolved in water. The aluminium oxide requires much more energy than the sodium chloride one. In the aluminium one, oxygen is formed, which reacts with the anode and the anode corrodes. That doesn't happen in the other one. You could also say that the Chlorine, one of the brine, has a membrane in the electrolysis and the aluminium one didn't. But here's your mark scheme there, look. You can see there's loads of similarities and even more differences, but you only need three of each and you're going to get your full six marks. And that's the end of that paper. So good luck with your revision. Hope you found that useful. Please let me know what you think. Use your likes and your comments features. Good luck with your revision.